Welcome to the fourth in our series of dovetailing topics, the Kaiser Anti-German Stereo in World War I, the killer, the flu pandemic of 1918-1919, the Klan, America's White Cancer, with an emphasis on the second wave of the 1920s, and this, the Cow War. All of these are reactionary movements in America's heartland, 1914 to 1934. I refer to these farmer rebellions of the Great Depression era as smoldering prairie fires. The emphasis here is the experience of farmers in the Midwest, which would be the 12 states reaching from Ohio to North Dakota down to Kansas and back to Ohio, with special emphasis on the experience of farmers in the upper Midwest, which is basically all those regions from a line roughly from Chicago to Kansas City. These farmer rebellions in America's heartland during the Great Depression have a lot to say about not only the era in which they took place, but our situation today. What's remarkable about that period is that otherwise law-abiding and mostly reticent Midwest farmers rebelled. They called strikes and took drastic actions. Some people got hurt and a few got killed. This is the story with a lot of the larger backstories. Of course, these farmers didn't strike in a vacuum. They took cues from other strikes going on, which we'll explore in this program. And what's primary is the background. The Great Depression for America's farmers really began almost a decade before the Great Depression began for the nation at large. Already immediately after World War I, overnight the federal government's farm supports were withdrawn. And just as quickly, farmers found they had not only less income, but they had fewer markets, which exacerbated the problem of what to do with all the produce they were raising for the war effort, which was now cessated. In the 1930s, on top of that, nature also proved to be treasonous. It got hot, it got dry, and the dust bowl arose on land that probably should never have been plowed, but it was during World War I to boost farm production. In this setting, hundreds of thousands of what were later called Okies, although Iowa also had <laughs> Iowa Okies, like this family, people in the Great Plains who dried up and their world shattered, given that the way of life that they had led no longer was sustainable. We have to look, though, to the policies of four men, Woodrow Wilson, President Harding, Coolidge, and Iowa's own native-born son, the Quaker Herbert Hoover, later president of the 1930s. All the policies of these men exacerbated the suffering of the people on the ground, and they did suffer. The economic hardships coupled with natural calamity sent hundreds of thousands, if not a couple million people, packing in search of work, but work also meant something to eat and a roof over their home heads. In 1929, the collapse of Wall Street changed the political context. Politicians who otherwise could rationally never have been elected, like Roosevelt, became viable candidates. The Republicans were held in disregard. The economic disaster was blamed largely on Hoover, to the degree that he deserved that or not. That's debatable. In any event, all these men sent packing, leaving their wives and children and other family members at home, were on the streets. The social tension rose. There were lots of conflicts between different groups with different interests and goals. And so the left, here symbolized by Milo Reno, Iowa-born Quaker farm boy who became a radical farm leader, and Iowa-born Henry Wallace on the right, who at that point became Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Secretary of Agriculture, a liberal. The Republicans, as I said, were out of favor. Their suggestions and goals and policies were no longer tolerated by most of the people looking for solutions. And so they turned to voices like the radicals under Milo Reno and to some extent the liberals like under Henry Wallace. And this itself causes a conflict. As Americans were generally struggling with the Great Depression, every fourth American had no work in some areas like Pittsburgh or other industrial cities, Detroit, that became every third American who was unemployed. On top of that, you had a lot of Americans who were underemployed. It means, of course, as it does today, that in a climate of low job availability, you don't leave a job that you have, even if it's an unfulfilling job or even under pain until you know there's a job to replace it. And in the Great Depression, there weren't jobs just laying around. And so you could say that half or maybe two-thirds of the people were unemployed or underemployed. That caused great emotional insecurity and social instability. So you get symbols of this insecurity in things like this newspaper ad, a whole page in the Ames, Iowa newspaper. An unusual measure was taken that three banks collaborated with taking out a full-page ad. 
subscribe to local professors, doctors, dentists, shopkeepers. And they said to the readers, don't panic. It's business as usual. (laughs) Well, actually, it wasn't business as usual at all. In fact, they said to the people reading this newspaper, don't panic. Everything's okay because everything wasn't okay. And they probably had grounds to panic. The message was, don't come and run the bank. Don't take your money out because the banks knew they couldn't sustain that. Rural poor, especially in areas like Appalachia, New Mexico, the upper Great Plains, suffered even more in this economic environment. They'd already been disadvantaged, but now many were dispossessed and would lose whatever homes they had, tenant farms or hired hand homes. They were living on marginal land in shacks, shanties. Some of those young adult rural poor went into the cities, registered at the overwhelmed employment offices, leaving their cards on file, looking for any work, including... Young women like Maradel Lassour, who was from a small coal mining town south of Des Moines, she went to St. Paul, Minnesota, and she wrote a very moving account of what it was like for young women going to the big city and waiting looking for a job. The urban poor also lost their apartments. They couldn't pay the rent. Or if they were paying a mortgage, they missed mortgage payments. People were dispossessed, kicked out in the streets literally overnight or within an hour. Here you see a picture of people who've taken their parlor pictures. You see family pictures hanging up, even taking old doors or stoves with them. People live in alleyways on abandoned lots on the margins. Where do you get your water in a situation like that? Where do you go to defecate? There were problems with sanitation, with outbreaks of cholera and other sanitation-borne problems. And there was hunger. In this period, there were literally millions of men set out and about. Why was this? Up until about the 1890s, 19-teens, America was very much a rural society. Until 1920, half of all Americans lived on the farm or in small towns. And as of 1920, the industrialization process had continued. You had a new phenomena. Millions of American families who had moved from the countryside into the city, looking for work in factories or the services that serve factory workers. And as opposed to the country, where there might have been grandparents living on the same property or even cousins or extended family members, in the cities, people lived diffused. A mother, a father, and eventually some children. So the nuclear family. In a time of scarce employment, you only have so much money to feed the family. Well, who eats the most? It's the male head of household. On top of that, especially in urban areas, low-level, entry-level, or moderate-skill-level jobs were very scarce. There was lots of competition. So men often left the home ostensibly to find work, but also to relieve the family food budget. And so you had literally tens of millions of American men looking for work, many of whom were literally out working, looking for work, plying the roads, This is where the term hobo arose. Hobo comes from the term homeless boys. And my grandma trams differentiate between hobos and bums this way. A hobo might come to the farm, knock on the door and look for some short-term work in exchange for a meal or maybe even a place to stay overnight, whereas a bum would just come and steal. Grandma told the story that bums would camp out north of the grove at some points of the year and in the night go to the chicken house and steal eggs or even chickens. This was a problem. Those were the bums. In any event, in the cities, men found accommodation wherever they could on stray benches or under bridges. And some of them were lucky enough to find food in the soup kitchens. Notice the men here, they don't look like street roughs. They look like unemployed line workers. And if you're looking at the fate of minorities during this period, 
Latin Americans, Mexicans, if you will, Hispanics, like these people were also sent packing with their meager collection of goods, not looking for work or a new start. Their fate was complicated by a policy set into effect by the Hoover administration and continued under the Roosevelt administration, where the United States government rounded up between a quarter and a third of a million, mostly Mexican, but Hispanic Americans, many of whom had been born in the United States, and collected them, sent them to bordered areas, put them on trains and buses, and sent them, quote, back home to Mexico, as we see in this scene from Los Angeles. There were several problems with this. Not only were, as I said, many of the people actually American citizens, many were rounded up in the night. They were given no chance to take any paperwork with them. They couldn't easily prove their nationality. But many of the children spoke no Spanish. They would arrive typically in Mexico without any family structures intact from the parents' emigration years before or their grandparents or great-grandparents' emigration. And they had no land. And so just as many would have been living on the margin of society in the United States, now they're in Mexico living in shanties and on marginal land. Going back to the Midwest, if we look at the situation, the plight of Ford motor workers. Henry Ford had motorized America after 1905, in the shortest time built an empire, and drew lots of workers, millions, into the auto industry, working in Michigan, Ohio, and other states. Well, when the market collapsed, the source of income for those men collapsed. There were hunger marches. Men said, we can't feed our families. We have nothing to live on since we're not working. You can't keep a cow on the balcony to milk and you can't grow a garden in your bathtub. So these nuclear family units living in apartments or little Victorian row houses in Detroit or Akron or anywhere else, how should they survive? There was a lot of violence that broke out when these hunger marches demanded relief and they got to certain points like bridges or intersections. They were often turned back or attacked by armed thugs from the automobile industry. In addition to the hunger strike going on in places like Detroit, you had the carrier strike in Minneapolis-St. Paul, where those driving the trucks who are literally taking across the nation food, clothing, furniture, dowels, toys, school supplies, they said, wait a minute, we're driving long hours across the country. We can't even supply these things to our own children. We need more pay. Well, that didn't sit well. So here are scenes from thousands of truckers in downtown Minneapolis and the demonstration being broken up by paid thugs. What does it mean, though, when in the middle of daylight on American streets, Americans are going after each other with baseball bats and clubs? Times have gotten pretty tough, huh? There was another kind of strike called the Bonus Army. In the 1920s, Congress had passed a bill into law acknowledging that, yes, during the recent World War, which we know as World War I, that was called then the Great War, soldiers were actually compensated less than factory workers. So while back home, factory workers were being paid to build shells and gas or tanks or anything else, the men actually drafted or who volunteered and sent to Europe were paid less to put their lives on the line and to endure mustard attacks and dodge bullets, and many were killed, of course. And they said, this isn't fair. Congress agreed, and in the mid-20s said, yes, we'll give you a bonus. Problem was, the bonus was supposed to be paid 20 years hence, as of 1945. I don't think anyone was clairvoyant enough to know that a second world war would come, and it would end in 1945. It was just a coincidence. During the Great Depression, however, those same veterans said, look, we won't survive this Great Depression by then. We're hungry now, in the 30s. We need the bonuses to start being paid now. So all across the country, that 40,000 veterans took rail cars, they piled into rickety trucks, some marched to Washington, D.C., and they gathered the veterans' bonus army, they called them themselves were demanding that veterans were acknowledged for what they had offered the country in the teens and now wanted to be helped in the time of need in the 30s. They camped out on the flats of Acostia along the Potomac. We see at the end of the main street, the ship's mass of this makeshift camp, and the men from all over the country organized of what to do next, how to get their bonus shelled out. Some were very clever and put up, for example, this ironic play in words, his home in Washington in a burial case. So he put up a vault where he's sleeping, saying that if I'm not helped soon, I won't make it till the 40s. I'll be dead. The strategy that the Bonus Army soldiers and their union organizer helpers and others came up with was they would appeal directly to Congress. So they went to the Capitol, organized by state delegations. Many of the men were wearing their uniforms from the Navy or from the Army. They had gathered and brought with them reams of paper of petitions from families and friends asking Congress to release these pensions early. And they asked to meet with their senators and representatives, a few of which can be seen here on the left, but the vast majority of which snuck out under the tunnels under the Capitol to their Senate and House office buildings, slipped out the back door, let the chauffeurs take them home to the suburbs and didn't want to deal with the whole controversy. The men, realizing that they'd been rejected and, and cold-shouldered, said, OK, we have time. We'll wait. We have nothing at home to go home for. They sat and wait. And notice what's really important in this the whole experience. You have, for the first time, really African-Americans and white Americans working together for common goals. 
they realize they have shared interests, and that is justice. In their waiting, they knew this would take some time, and they set up camp literally on the grounds of the capital and built up makeshift shelters. This, of course, was doomed. At some point, the Washington Police Department sent officers to break up these squatters. We see in the background a abandoned building that had become a place for the men to stay. But even in the foreground, we see the man with the torn shirt, another picking up a brick to throw, another has a pipe. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat in the nation's capital. The Washington police could not prevail, so President Hoover sent in the army. He sent MacArthur. MacArthur wasn't going to, quote, fool around with these veterans and ordered to burn down their accommodations. And his helper was the Greenhorn Dwight Eisenhower, the Kansan-born boy who was cutting his teeth on his career, too, in this situation, where the U.S. Army brought in tanks, gas, soldiers, bayonets, and, and horses. The nation, of course, was stunned. This was pure drama as the nation saw photographs of the Capitol burning. Again, Black and White United came together. We see in this picture done by one of the Bonus Army veterans, we see Black and White supporting each other. We see the Washington cops in the back left. Then the U.S. soldiers come with tanks and fire to clear the men out. And we also see the Union organizers in the background on the right. This was a huge social movement and would lead to later social movements in the 40s and 50s. This poster calls Black and White to come again and to continue lobbying Congress even in the winter of 1932. But back to the Midwest. So the trucker strike in Minnesota wasn't moving things very fast and it was becoming ugly. Farmers in the Midwest, though, took cues and said, if the truckers can strike, if the veterans can strike, if the former automobile workers can strike, we can strike. So they did. Here's a column of Midwest farmers marching from the Minnesota capital in St. Paul to downtown. And they had a chant. Stay at home. Buy nothing. Sell nothing. Stay at home. Buy nothing. Sell nothing. Another favorite chant of theirs was... Let's call a farmer's holiday a holiday let's hold. Let's eat our wheat and ham and eggs and let them eat their gold. They were marching for what they called social justice and equality. These are northwest Wisconsin farmers. In my native Iowa, farmers also set up roadblocks. They put spikes and poles and otherwise block roads so that commodities could be not taken to market. The idea was we'll force up the price of our produce for everyone by decreasing the amount going to market, even if we have to block roads to do it. The strike was on. Notice the cartoon figure in the lower left is basically Uncle Sam dressed in farmer garb. This was seen as a patriotic movement. They didn't feel like they were treasonous or against the status quo as such. They were loyal, but they wanted to eat and survive and keep their farms. One young man, a teenager driving a truck to the city, got shot and killed. There were roadblocks across the region. Some people got beat up. Tires were slashed. Livestock was set loose. Grain was turned out in the ditches and spoiled. It was like a grass fire. All across the region, farmers struck. The dairymen joined this all across the upper Midwest, especially National Farmers Holiday members would send their sons because someone to stay home to milk the cows. And across the Midwest, rivers of milk were pouring a great metaphor for a real crisis. Land of milk and honey was in trouble. The crisis intensified and spread, which was a perfect climate for Milo Reno to gain more attention and more support, although he was controversial, of course. And he called for even more direct action. He became the focus of this whole crisis, and the state government and federal government didn't miss that if they wanted to move this, they had to deal with him. Let's look at one example of how this crisis got out of hand by going to Lamar's, Iowa. In quieter days, it was just another little Midwest county seat, Lyons County. But it was there in the courthouse that Judge C.C. Bradley drew negative attention to himself by refusing to concede to the farmers who demanded, we want relief, don't order foreclosure auctions. We're losing our farms, our land, our ways of life, the ability to feed our families. When we walk across the cemeteries of the Midwest these days, we step on so many plots, we have no idea what stories are laying beneath the ground. This one's a rich one, very rich. This film, which was shown in movie theaters during that period, shows the Marshall Rule being enacted in Lyon County and three other Northwest Iowa counties.
At first, Main Street looks normal, but as we look and give it a closer look, we see that military camps were set up around the town in some of the farm yards with Gatling guns in case the farmers would storm. The army sent out men with guns and perhaps bayonets to round up farmers and bring them into these encampments and basically put them in pens to be dealt with by the authorities. This is martial rule, something that Iowans really didn't know before. That man is the same one who later would be in charge of martial rule in eastern Iowa counties, but that's another story coming. The obituary for Charles Bradley tells in detail some of the significant backstory around this drama. Who's the mother blower that the obituary refers to? Well, let's look at that. She was indeed an organizer, but in the 1930s, the woman was in her 70s. When she was younger, she probably was a force to reckon with, but by her 70s, I'm not sure how much revolution she could have ignited, but she was indeed blamed for much of the unrest in Northwest Iowa. We know her, or at least we know her family. For example, her granddaughter married who we knew as Grandpa Walton, Richard Gere. He indeed had been in the 30s a rural organizer in the California Central Valley. She too, like the good judge, also lays beneath the turf, and her stories are there as well. If we discover them and uncover them, they can tell us much about our current day. These hated forced foreclosure auctions were a plague ravaging the Midwest farm scene. Here we see an Iowa auction. On the right will be the auctioneer, plus a clerk with a movable pult on which he can write sale bills. But we also see the militia on the edge of the crowd with clubs or guns. This is a good example of the so-called penny auctions. For example, when the cream supper was brought out to be auctioned off, maybe it was worth $5. Perhaps they'd be able to get five cents out of it. Or when the hay fork was brought out to be sold, it would be offered at pennies of what it was actually worth. Without a hay fork, though, the farmers couldn't farm. Or when they brought out their team of horses. Maybe a good broken team of horses should fetch $75. Maybe they could get the crowd to commit to 75 cents. At some point, though, the banker would say, you folks are in cahoots. And he and the sheriff and the militia people would all get in the cars or trucks and go back to town. The banker was right. They were in cahoots because after the authorities left, the farmers would come over one by one to the farm couple and say, here, here are the bills of sale for your separator, for your hay fork, for your horses. Keep them. Keep your farm. This is how the farmers helped each other survive the Great Depression. This was a widespread phenomenon reported on at the time, and it's one of the few ways that farmers could help each other stay on their farms. Merchants also got involved with trying to help find alternative ways to help farmers weather this ongoing crisis. In my old hometown of Clear Lake, Iowa, for example, the merchants created their own script. Why did the merchants come to the farmers' aid, and why did the farmers themselves so stubbornly support each other? Well, it was survival. For example, think of the threshing crews. If a third of the farms went under, and one third of this threshing ring were to drift off looking for jobs in the city, their way of life destroyed and their means of making a living taken from them, how would the other two-thirds on that threshing crew continue? How would they be able to get their crops brought in at, at harvest time? Who would own the threshing machines in common? Who would keep it going? Who would feed it with fuel or coal or wood? How would farming be possible without their neighbors? Their support for each other would become challenged by a, a law passed by the Iowa legislature in 1929, the law relating to bovine tuberculosis eradication, when the Iowa legislature agreed, as did other Midwest state legislatures, that we must take care of TB, which is jumping from cows to people. A footnote here, farmers love their cows. I loved my calves. But cows also, of course, are not just our friends. They're a way that we make money. Beef or dairy cows doesn't matter. In those days, most farms had at least a few cows, and they would have surplus cream or milk to sell. There's a backstory here, though. Those same farm animals that were the key to farmers' survival were sometimes endangered, not from marauding dogs or disease, but from humans. For example, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt took power in 1933, one of the Department of Agriculture policies that was sent to place was the killing of seven hogs on every farm. Whether you had 10 hogs or a 1,000, it didn't really matter. Federal agents would come and before your eyes shoot seven pigs. Here we see the boulder hole behind the pig's ear. My grandmother Trams, my mother's mother, told me numerous times when I was a boy that they never again voted Democratic. They had voted for Roosevelt, as did many Americans for the first time voting for Democrat. She was disgusted, she said, because the farmers were not allowed to butcher, otherwise gain from the carcass of the seven hogs. 
In fact, they had to bury or burn the dead carcass before the eyes of the agents, before the agents left the farmstead. So livestock became politicized during the Great Depression, especially in the case of the cow war, when Iowa legislature mandated that the state veterinarian would go around the state and confirm that all dairy herds in Iowa were tuberculosis free. Any contagious cows would have to be destroyed. One third of the cost would be returned to the farmer by the feds. One third would be given to the farmer from the state. And the third third of the loss would have to be incurred by the farmers themselves. Well, for farmers who are barely managing to survive anyway, it wasn't just the cost, the market value of their cows that they were losing. They were losing future income sources on the sale of milk, cream, and meat. Farmers, seeing that their way of life was endangered, went to the state capitol. Thousands of them drove and then marched onto the capitol. They occupied the state house and they even filled the galleries of Congress and they of the state legislature, and they demanded that their issues be heard and there be redress. This led, of course, to a huge conflict, and eventually some of the farmers would end up in the state prison. This happened because the Republican governor, Dan Daniel Webster Turner of southwestern Iowa, said no. He was sympathetic. He was a farmer himself. But he said this is the law, and to exact the law, he even got to the point of calling out the Iowa National Guard. When hundreds of farmers in Cedar County refused to have their herds tested by state veterinarians or anyone else, the governor called out a couple thousand National Guard members, and they literally occupied the county. The farmers had come up with passwords that they would use on their party telephone lines to call each other out in code, saying, meet at such and such a farm, the veterinarians are coming, and they would literally block the herds from being tested, often with clubs and sticks. The contents of night pots were thrown often on the veterinarians. Some were roughed up. A car was overturned, filled with mud. This riot really grew out of hand and became a small war. The Des Moines Register sent one of its airplanes to photograph the scene from the air. It was such a big deal. In Des Moines, the governor said, no, again, the cows will be tested. He issued a proclamation which had the weight of law behind it, and he would send the military. Cedar County became occupied by several thousand troops. Out of the fairground, they established a camp. This is the spring and fall of 1931, the whole story taking place over the course of a, of a spring, summer, and early fall. Here's the courthouse steps when Jacob Lenker, a German-American farmer, maybe he was called a home, Jakob Lenker, went on air and said, we will resist this. It is our right to protect our way of life. The farmers had been all hopped up by the below fellow, a radio station owner in Muscatine, Iowa, an extravagant man who drove a purple car and I was known to dress very wildly. He had convinced the farmers before this that the tuberculosis threat was fake news, that they shouldn't concede to the state, that they should insist on their rights, even if it meant breaking the law. Of course, at some point, the farmers were outmuscled, outmaneuvered, and outfoxed. And farm by farm, the state veterinarians were escorted under the sites. Hers were tested. However, there were political costs to be paid for this showdown between the state government and local farmers. In the election of 1932, Dan Turner was voted out of office, replaced by a Democrat, Clyde Herring. Iowans were appalled that the state would use force to tell farmers what to do. Remember that most Iowans still have rural roots, and in those days... Iowa is very much a rural state, much more than today. So far, we've been talking about all of this in abstractions. What about the experience of one Iowa farm family, one that I know quite well, my own? If we look at the Lewick farmstead near Thornton, Iowa, in this period in the 1930s, and go even for a closer look, what we find is a family, my father on the wheel of that tractor with my grandfather. In the background, his father and mother, my great-grandparents, on a rented farm. The Lewicks were tenant farmers, often moving that period every year or so. Unlike my mother's people, actually owned land and stayed on that farm for 105 years. The Lewicks were moving around, and during the Great Depression, it became very difficult to sustain their way of life. Of course, my father's parents had both grown up after World War I in a time of boom, at least for the nation, when they didn't know hunger or great struggles. The 20s had been an era of fast living in the cities of flask, hip, hooch, Charleston, outrageous behaviors, great expansion in consumption, in shopping, in home building. My grandma was a very clever girl. She was a valedictorian of her class of 1931. She was good at math and Latin, which is not typically seen as an area where girls excel. And she wanted to be a teacher. She wanted to go to the Iowa State Teachers Normal School in Cedar Falls. She had saved her pin money. She'd worked already as a girl on Main Street of Rockwell, Iowa. She told us for a dime an hour, and this was her plan. Then the banks closed, and she lost her savings, and that was the end of her teaching dreams. Plus, she met my grandfather. 
He was sort of an Elmer Gantry character. He liked to dress in fancy clothes, go driving at night fast on those country roads. He liked to roller skate. He read the newspaper avidly. He liked to read magazines and to think about better farming methods. He was hungry for knowledge, but he wasn't particularly well educated. He was, however, the first of his family to graduate from high school. His parents obviously were very proud of that because they paid a lot of money relatively to their income for embossed graduation announcements and a class ring, which I still have, with an L engraved in the gold ring. But while Gramps was still in the Thornton School, he enjoyed himself playing the saxophone, second from the left in the school band, also a catcher on the far left of the baseball team, because he knew that once his school days were over, it wouldn't be physics, it'd be pigs, it wouldn't be chemistry, it'd be cows that would fill his days. And so he made the most of it. His going for fast drives, amusements, meeting with friends, those days were limited. When we asked Grandma how they met, she said they had gone dancing, afterwards went for a drive, and then the next thing they knew, they were expecting a baby. My grandparents went one Sunday unannounced to Little Brown Church in the Vale. When I was doing my research, I called the church and the secretary evidently didn't know who she was talking to. And she said quite freely, oh, yes, we often change the dates of the wedding to match the arrival of the first baby. This was the 1930s version of Planned Parenthood. So my grandparents, with little preparation and with no previous announcement, just snuck off and got married. Then, lacking the money to do anything else, they went to Minnesota to stay with her aunt and the aunt's family in Minnesota and spend their honeymoon. Grandma up in the hill, she met my grandfather, was very much a charge of her grandparents. It was the death of her dead mother's mother that led to the occasion of my grandma leaving her grandfather behind. He'd been the mayor of Little Rockwell, Iowa, after he left the farm. And she looked into her own life, and she knew that in the Great Depression time, raising children alone would not be a happy scenario. And my young grandfather, for his part, knew that a single young farmer needed a mate to help make the farm work. Young farmers were struggling. Indeed, they did marry. They rented the farm that my grandmother's grandfather had vacated when he moved to Rockwell, later became mayor. We have found a check. This says a great deal about that period. The banks were filling at such a rate that they didn't even bother printing new checks. They just crossed out the previous bank's name, the bank's location. This is the rent check from my grandfather, Donald Lewick, to his grandfather-in-law, George Edward Moorhead, and likely was either the rent, $100, for the use of the 120-acre farm, either for 1936, the check's dated December 16th, 1936, or for the coming year of 1937. In any event, the young couple, the newlyweds, did get their first child, Aunt Lorraine. Grandma told us when we were children that Aunt Lorraine came 15 weeks early, and to us, we believe that. We were naive kids. Of course, do the math. Other children arrived as well, and soon Donald and Charlotte had four children to raise with very little money. Leapfrogging past many stories, I have to ask myself, what was it that my father learned? He was born in 1936, the last half of the Great Depression, and then during World War II, became a de facto hired hand for his father. He said he often drove the tractor having to stand up. He couldn't even reach the pedals. How did that all affect him and his father? It's harder to say. 20 years after the end of World War II, however, we have this article from 1966. My father on top right and my grandfather on the bottom left. They're both on the meat committee of the NFO, the National Farmers Organization. What was that? Ironically, it was the former Iowa Republican governor, Dan Turner, the very same one who called out the state militia to occupy Cedar County and other areas of Iowa during farmer rebellions, who helped co-found the NFO and advised young farmers how to collectively bargain by marketing their wares together. I remember well my father and his friends being involved in the NFO in the 1960s and early 70s, when initially there were great successes. Like in the Great Depression, the farmers of the Midwest again poured milk out. There were rivers of white crisscrossing the upper Midwest. And the NFO's response to farm troubles of the 60s very much had its origins in the experiences of farmers in the 1930s. In the lower right, my great-grandfather standing behind the mechanics of that threshing machine. And in the top left photo, great-grandpa's on the far right. And Gramps is in the middle with a zippered shirt. The NFO for a while did have some important successes. It made some great gains, for example, even taking their cause to the White House. Here where they petitioned and asking urbanites, farmers get 15 cents for pork. What does your wife pay? Yeah, it's a good question. 
All of my grandfather's NFO involvement, though, came to an abrupt stop when he dropped dead in July of 1966. Even in his death, however, notice at the lower right corner of the top of the auction bill that the lunch was served by the NFO ladies. So even during the selling off of his and my grandmother's equipment and remaining animals, most of the children were already out of the house by that point. The proceeds from the lunch tent went to the NFO. As a boy spending summers with my grandma on the farm, a new widow, she was lonely and often liked having us grandkids around. I had the feeling when we went to Main Street of Thornton, to Mab's Grocery, or to Cobb's Hardware, or any of the other shops there, the Chit Chat Cafe, that the Lewicks were seen as sort of local minor heroes, that the NFO had some esteem even for years thereafter. Certainly, after Grandpa's death, Grandma was awarded a clock by the local NFO, and the clock was bearing the proud plaque, thanking Donald Lewick for his support of the NFO locally and statewide. Well, what became of all those farm folk, those resilient people who, despite all those travails, kept on farming? A poem from the 1930s gives us some indication. This is from a farm magazine or some other document of the period that published this saying, the farmers say that corn and hay don't pay them for their time, that oats and rye don't get them by, and the cows don't earn a dime, that all that's high is what they buy or have to have from town, and even rain don't show a gain, for it pulls the prices down. The Solons, meaning wise people, or in this case it's an ironic term given to the politicians hawking for votes, the Solons beef a farm relief to get the farmers' votes while Wall Street stands with clutching hands to get their corn and oats. They bought the dirt and lost their shirt, and the banks have called them in, but just the same, you'll find them game. Next year, they'll try again. Thank you for your interest in the story of farmer rebellions during the Great Depression. More information is available at our website, traces.org. That's www.traces.org. For those who are particularly interested in the obituary of C.C. Bradley, we also offer it in its fuller length here and elsewhere.